Hey everyone and welcome back to my channel. If you're new here, I'm Tara, a farmer from Northern California and this channel is mainly about farming, but sometimes it's not. And today we are going on a field trip. Okay, for today's episode, we are in Shafter, which is the Central Valley. Yeah, we're the southern end of the Central Valley. Okay, <laughs> southern end of the Central Valley, and I am with Jenny. And if you guys have Instagram, she's on Instagram as Almond Girl Jenny. That's mm -hmm. the, probably the best place to follow you, yeah, right? Yeah, absolutely. And we are in your almond orchard <laughs> today. So do you want to give a little history on yourself? Do you come from a farming family? Has this always been what you did? Or, you know, what's a little history? Yep. Yeah. So I'm a fourth generation California farmer. I grew up in Northern California in Chico. Oh, and that's, that's where I went to college. Yeah. Cool. That's where my family farms almonds and walnuts. Okay. So that's why I say almond. A lot of people oh. down here will say almond. Oh, so is that like a NorCal, yeah. SoCal thing? It is. I thought it was the... like a different state thing. Like <laughs> I, I'm still confused by the almond, I almond. I didn't know there was another way to say it until I went to college. So it was <laughs> almond up there. Almond. Oh, it was almond up there. Yes. Yep. And Northern down here California it's almond. almond. Yep, down here it's oh. almond. Right? I've always said almond. Have you? I feel like. Yeah. I don't know. Pecan, pecan, whatever. Do you have a preference? Um, almond is more natural. Okay. I'll say almond, but it, I have to think about it. Okay. And it's not a natural flow off. Do people make fun of you around here? Yeah, they know I'm, <laughs> a, they know I'm not a native <laughs> okay. if I say almond. Okay. Yes, absolutely. They'll look at me like, where are you from? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, so you guys grew almonds up there. Yep, I grew up, my family farmed um, almonds and walnuts. Okay. And then I went to college and met my husband at Cal Poly. Okay. Um, and he brought me here. Where his family is also fourth generation. So we're oh, both awesome. fourth generation farmers. Um, and he's been farming with his family here um, since the early 1900s, the, our family has been here. Nice. Um, so we have been farming um, almonds since the um, early 60s. Okay. Here. In, in Shafter and Wasco. No. So I'm not exactly sure when this video will come out. So I just want to say we're recording this in early January. Mm -hmm. So everything is dormant right yep. now. Yep. But is there ever a time, and maybe it is sort of right now, but is there ever a time where there's just nothing going on? I wouldn't say there's never nothing going on. Mm -hmm. It's definitely less okay. busy certain times of the year. Right. Um, but there's still there's still always things going on. Um, when the trees are dormant like this is when we do pruning. Okay. So that's um, a busy time of year. Yeah. Lots of crews out here pruning mm -hmm. um, and hedging. We oh. get big large hedgers that yeah, come like, out. Those ones are like the spinning. Yes. Oh, I didn't big. know they did that in almonds. Yep. Yep. So we go through the middles and you, you can see if you yeah. look down the center of the row, there's like a perfect line yes. down the middle. Yep, yep, so that was because these, these were hedged. Mm -hmm. So where are you guys at right now? So what, what is kind of happening this time of year? Mm -hmm. Or just did you just finish doing anything? Yeah, so we just finished uh, winter shaking, which is also called mummy shaking. Um, and it's any of the almonds that would have been left on the tree after harvest. I mean, sometimes, you know, it's a huge tree with lots of different almonds on it. They're not always ready at the same time, just like your backyard plum or or orange tree they're not all ready at the same time um, so some of them may what we call stick to the to the tree and mm -hmm. not come off during harvest so we come through about December January and do a mummy shake and shake all those off again okay. um, so the shakers will come through just like harvest and shake all the extra mummies off that would have been left on um, the the thing is, if we leave those on, then those become breeding grounds for insects to overwinter, live in the tree, and then in spring when the blooms come out, you know, those little larvae and babies hatch and then they also come out. Right. So that could be really detrimental to the orchard. Yeah. So we need to mummy shake those. And it's done the exact same way as harvesting. Yeah. The same machine. So yep. do we have the, are they on the ground anywhere? Yeah. Yep. You can see them all over here. So they're basically almonds that weren't ready in time. Yep. So if I cracked this open, would there be an almond in there? Yeah, probably. Not that I could get it open. I know. <laughs> so there's a couple layers. This is the, what's the green That's part? That's the hull. This is the hull. Yep. And, and then, then you have the shell, the right? The shell, yep. And then inside is the meat. Um, or the almond or the a, almond that uh, you know of. Wa I know. Uh, like a walnut cracker. Um, 
But oh, this is oh, exactly gosh, why we shake. Sh look at that. Oh that my That is gosh. exactly why we mummy shake. Wow, it's completely so full it's of alive. Bugs. Yep, and it's alive. There's a worm in here, and that is what we want to get out of our trees. That is a perfect example. Yeah. Wow. Look at <laughs> that mine is, is empty. terrible. And you see what it did to the to it, the almond? Did it, it just eat it? yep, it totally ate it, and it's burrowing in it and making a home. So we want to get these out and then when they're on the ground like this is when um, we have blowers on our sweepers just like we would sweep the ammon um, into the windrows during harvest. We use the sweepers now to move all of the these mummies into the into the rows so away from the, the trees mm -hmm. and move them into the rows and then we'll have a, a mower come through and chop them all up. So if there are any worms or anything in it we'll chop those little yucky things up um, and make sure that they don't make a habitat in our orchard and yeah. potentially ruin our next crop next year. Wow, what a great example. Because yeah. look at the one I cracked open was clean. <laughs> but yeah. that's a perfect example of what we don't want. Okay, so we have a little bit of a younger tree here. How old do you think this tree is? Do you have any idea? Well, if you don't, know. it's okay. It's probably three. Well, it has some nuts on it, so probably three to four. Okay. Probably. Yeah, so you can see here okay. how this was pruned where you took, they took off this and they took off this. Yes. Because this right here, if that was growing up, it would grow up right in the middle of these two and then these wouldn't get as big and strong because it would have a competing branch right here taking its energy um, right here. Yeah, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. And then this one would probably just stick out in an awkward kind of, you want it to look um, it looks like a little... they most kind of open in the center, yes. like there's a little bowl in yep. the center. So this one wouldn't really go with the, I would say, the form that you're really looking for. Okay. Mm -hmm. So just kind of as they get older, you kind of, yeah, because I mean, if you look at them, they all kind of have like open centers yep. and that's with to big branches the more, out the side. You want that sunlight. So that's to make sure that the sunlight is getting into the, to the middle of the trees mm -hmm. and is helping with the tree growth and the blooms and you know creating a space for the bees to get in right that's all what you're you're thinking of when you're when you're pruning yeah yeah okay so it mm -hmm. takes work it's not like you just stick a tree oh, in the no. ground and it grows definitely not and then how long does it take to get like a decent crop off of a tree so um the first harvest is usually about three years it okay. usually take about five years before i will really be profitable okay like mm -hmm. a full crop mm -hmm. very cool yeah. okay so then after everything is shook and swept up or ground up what's your guys's next is it not till spring so the next thing about a month from now actually in the middle of february is when the blooms start to pop and that's what's so, really pretty yes, right that is the most beautiful time <laughs> of year to be an avon farmer it is just gorgeous out here that's when everyone takes their family yes. photos <laughs> that's when we have lots of people trespassing <laughs> on our property yes. if you yes. want to take a photo in an avon orchard talk just to talk to the farmer because they'll <laughs> yes. probably say yes, yes but please ask permission but please ask yes. i totally please feel ask. you yeah i mean we have bees out here obviously ammons are entirely dependent upon bees yeah um so we the bees will carry the pollen and that's why we have so in this orchard we have two different varieties okay um there's non pearl and monterey and that's um all all almond orchards will have at least two varieties some have three um and it's because the bees have to carry pollen from that one variety to the other variety mm -hmm. and that's cross pollination and that's how we get an almond okay um, so we are entirely so dependent upon have them to cross any well the, not those specific okay okay but um monterey is the most popular there's probably about 50 percent of the production is monterey they mm. usually have the best or as uh, non pearl sorry non pearl is the most popular and they usually have the best price mm. um so but then you have other varieties that can can um, go with that okay um and those are what we call california varieties so they're that softer shell where we were able to mm -hmm. to get it open we also have hard shell varieties um butte mission fritz those are a hard um it's really hard for you to open it <laughs> with your hands they're a much smaller variety and those um are compatible so those will pollinate each other okay mm -hmm. and do you you have to hire someone to bring bees in yep we work with a beekeeper it's okay. a family friend and he you know brings um brings 
his bees and then also bees he contracts out with other beekeepers. We have a million acres plus of almonds in the state of California. Wow. And the general rule of thumb is you need two hives per acre to pollinate. Wow. <laughs> so you can imagine California does not have enough bees right. to do all of that. People truck bees in from all over the nation. I mean, Florida, North Dakota, South Dakota, Canada. Bees are coming from all over the place for California almond bloom. Wow. Um, so there's a lot of bees are coming in here. Um, but that's our beekeeper helps facilitate all that. And we just tell him how many hives we need and he gets them here. <laughs> so we drove a few miles down the way and we are in one of their brand new orchards. So you can't really see any trees, but there are a whole bunch of little baby trees here. So is this, was this just planted this year yeah. or 2020? 2020, yep, in the fall. These were just planted and they're already starting to sprout What's a What's the sticks for? Um, so when they get a little bit bigger, we will um, tie them in like a figure eight pattern. Okay. Um, onto the stick to make sure that they stay up and grow nice and straight. Okay. We don't want them to, you know, grow sideways right, or Right, right, start leaning. Yep, so we keep, we tie them to the stake as they get bigger. Um, to make sure that they grow tall and straight. And then eventually do those stakes just come out? Yep, yep. So when they get bigger and they're able to have a, I mean, if you can see, the tree is very fragile. Yeah, it's right actually now. even tied to a stick here. It's tri yep, it's tied to a bamboo, a bamboo stake right there. Oh, yeah. So you can see it's guy. very, yes, very fragile. So after a few years when it gets bigger, we'll take this big, this one will come off when we tie it to this, and then this one will come off after a few years um, when it's stronger and able to support itself better. And so so this um, orchard, you guys have a little bit more of a unique setup mm -hmm. to save water, yeah. right? Which, uh, do you want to explain that to us then? Yeah, so this, before we planted this orchard, we put in a tile drain system. A lot, Some people have it up in the Delta. Yes. We're using it for the opposite of right. what we are using it for. So in a wet year or when um, we get, so we get a, some water off the Kern River here. Okay. Um, that's a large area, um, but we also get water from Millerton and some of the other um, some of the other close by areas okay. and when there's an increase of snow mm -hmm. in the mountains um, not not the year like this obviously <laughs> but when there's um, a lot of snow in the mountains and that starts to melt okay. and come off and there's an increase of water availability mm -hmm. but we may not have a use for that water yet mm -hmm. um, we've started to put in these tile drain systems um, in the Central Valley to help take that water when it's available and store it underground well let's just look at the fancy contraption <laughs> we're not exactly sure how all the moving parts work but so this is part of the system at least yeah it's part of our so irrigation we know. system too so this is used to irrigate the fields but it's also um, used to uh, filter the water and uh, keep it clean for the orchard but then also uh, part of this is for the tile drain system as well okay so this all goes underground yes yep and then... all these pipes come in from the so this is the district outlet over here and the water comes um, from right here from our district. Okay, so so here is the district. Mm -hmm. And then is that where, is this, uh, is this it is also get the comes. underwater? Yep, so this is where water would be coming from when we get district allocation water. Okay. This is where water comes um, from district water or, you know, and we would be using it if there's a heavy uh, flow year where we were able to get more water, mm -hmm. this is where we would be getting it from. Okay. So one question I had was about putting the drip line underground which I, I understood the benefits of that, but do you guys have like a problem with like the lines getting clogged or anything like that? Cause we, I, my drip line is like the most difficult type of drip line. Cause mm -hmm. it's like up here. Oh. Like, so even you have to like yeah, climb under weird. the vine and under, but the reason was is so nothing would catch on it. Okay. And so it wouldn't get dirt in it. Okay. That's why I lifted yes. it up. Yep. So do you guys have that problem or do you have a certain type of drip line that you feel like you don't experience that too much? No, I mean, we have a filter station, um, you know, at the, over there but what about like the dirt getting in yeah no. No, it doesn't like clog know. it from the outside no you guys are good no we have an issue um with gophers sometimes chewing it would be going in and chewing it but we have a bigger issue here with coyotes i was gonna say yeah <laughs> i have coyotes that chew mine yes. Yes. i think i put it right at the perfect mouth yep. level and they'll chew on it. it's so, so that actually obvious helps us burying it we don't get the coyotes because it's buried they don't see it they so don't want on it top, they see it 
we, that's a bigger issue. When it's buried, it's not a problem. And then, so the neighbors have like micro sprinklers, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And have those been found as efficient as? I think it's a preference. Okay. Um, I think drip is probably the most efficient okay. where we are um, for our soil type, but in different soils, um, it has different efficiency. Yeah, because I, because uh, like if you have too sandy mm -hmm. sprinklers, they're supposed to be better, right? Because yeah. if you have really sandy drip, I think goes. it goes straight down. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Yeah, so you guys are probably like the smartest when it comes to water, <laughs> you know, yeah. like figuring out the best way to use it. Right. Now, is it a is it true or is it a rumor that almonds use like the most water? No, that that's total rumor. Total Just rumor. okay. And I feel like same, I've heard that. Yes, I know. They it use so the much drought, water. A, I use a gallon per almond. Um, but we use no different in almonds than any other nut or fruit tree. Mm -hmm. So in pistachios, walnuts, even peaches, plums, we all pretty much use about the same amount of water. Okay. Um, but the thing about when people were spreading the how much it takes to grow, it's we're not just growing the one almond. Right. Either. How we talked about earlier, we're growing that hull mm -hmm. and a shell, mm -hmm. and we're growing a tree. Yeah. That's supposed to last us 20 to 25 years. Right. So that water's not just going to the nut, mm -hmm. but that hull is used in animal feed. We feed it to the dairies, to the feedlots. They use that to, their cows eat that. Right. The shells are used. Um, and animal bedding, they're used in landscape beds. Um, there's a whole bunch of different purposes for that. So yeah, we're not so just Yeah, so little to no meat. waste. Yes, exactly, yeah. we have no waste. Every piece farm. of the, even though we're just eating the almond, the other yep. layers are getting used Absolutely. for something beneficial. Mm -hmm. We grind Oh, into orchard, wood chips? Into wood chips. So all of our giant <laughs> almond trees yeah. are chipped down into small little pieces and then we disc them up into the soil. So all of it, all the whole tree. So not that tree. none of the wood chips get taken away. No, the whole the whole orchard, every single tree gets chipped into small little pieces like this and gets disced into the soil. I feel like that's probably good though, because is it adding more yeah, nutrients? I think that, exactly. All the nutrients that we spent the last 20, 25 years putting into these trees now stays here. Right. Yeah. It gets put back into the ground. It's put back into the ground. Yeah, and you can see and the wood chips everywhere. So over the course of, I mean, you can see it pretty well right here because this tr um, orchard was just planted. Right. Um, but it'll all break down. Yep. Over the course of the next five, ten years, these things won't be here anymore. Yeah. So they'll, they'll disintegrate into the soil. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Really no waste. Yep. No waste. That's awesome. Okay. So we, so the last orchard we were in was hard shell mm -hmm. and this we're back at the home orchard, mm -hmm. which is soft shell. Mm -hmm. And you were explaining to me that almonds actually have different purposes, yes. certain varieties, yep. which I really just never even thought of. Right. And, uh, you know, it's the same as grapes, right? Mm -hmm. Different grapes. There's table grapes, there's wine grapes, certain grapes go into raisins. Mm -hmm. They're all different. It's not the same grape as turned into different things. Right. So do you want to explain a little bit about the different, because like some of the things you told me, I didn't even think of. <laughs> yeah, so there's actually over 40 different commercial almond varieties. Okay. So lots of different varieties. Um, I would say there's probably 10 to 15 that are more widely produced, um, but everything has its own different use. Okay. So the hard shells are the smaller nut. Okay. Um, those ones are really honestly are pretty small size okay. and those are definitely where you just bite the whole thing mm -hmm. so that's what people use for the almond joy or your hershey's little bite size yeah. candy bars because they want that to just bite it and not have to bite the almond in half just while you're a little the baby bar. exactly <laughs> yep so those are used for that uh -huh. um some of the larger varieties um are are used for the sliced or slivered okay because they want a long you want a longer um almond yeah. to be able to slice it into more pieces yes and i feel like those are used a lot for baking and yep. stuff right the slivered uh -huh. style yep. okay exactly and then um the non Perel, which is the more widely variety um, that's more mass produced mm -hmm. um, that's more that's your premium nut okay so a lot of times that will go to your just consumption your snack right. nut and that's what you sell mm -hmm. mainly. and that's what yeah. I sell okay. so okay so you were just telling me how the different variety has the painting on it mm -hmm. now so that's just for us internally I was gonna say is that just for you to know because mm -hmm. the tree isn't treated any different no. they're not pruned differently that's just for us to know which variety is which um, I guess if you ever had to replant maybe uh -huh. or something exactly okay yep, that's exactly so when we okay. need, if something if one of them gets sick or hurt and it falls 
then we will know which one to replant. Okay. Yeah. And then we were talking about, we previously we were saying how um, basically in these orchards, they do everything they can to create the least amount of waste. Mm -hmm. And I was asking Jenny if there's a certain kind of nut that is for almond milk. Which it's not, mm -hmm. but do you want to explain what, yeah. even though it's not, you said it's a byproduct, mm -hmm. right? Yep. But it's basically to create less waste. Exactly. Yep. So during the processing, when the almonds are taken from the hull and the shell, and sometimes nuts can get, you know, broken mm -hmm. or chipped or mm -hmm. scratched. And those are become inedibles. Mm -hmm. We can't sell that um, for consumption because it's it's flawed. It's imperfect. It's imperfect. <laughs> this is going to be my new my new phrase that we need to lower our standards yep. on what food needs to look like. So with that imperfection, it gets put to use via almond milk. Okay. So they take those imperfect, flawed ones and they can soak those and make almond milk out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I have an off-farm job, but we I would like the farm to be able to sustain Yeah, sustain the farm still needs to be successful. <laughs> yes. um, so we looked at ways we could diversify. And for mm. us, that meant um, selling some consumer direct product. Okay. So we started um, in August of last year this last year yeah yeah because it's 2021 yeah. now <laughs> <laughs> so after we harvested this crop here at our homestead block um it went down the street for um to get the hulls and the shells removed okay. and um we got our product back and Yay. started to sell it to consumers okay so now you can go on it's it's all under our almond girl label and you can go on my website at almondgirl.com and you can buy almonds fresh from our family farm so is anything done to those? No, these are fresh raw. Okay. So we wanted a product that was exactly that, fresh from our farm. Mm -hmm. And you know, if, if it goes to further processing and all the other stuff added to it, it's not fresh anymore is right. kind of was our thought. Mm -hmm. And if you're buying product from a farmer, this is how you buy it from a farmer. Yeah, so that's basically straight out of the field. Yeah, I mean, it's as fresh as you can really get. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. okay, let's do a close up on yeah. that. So we've got Almond Girl, we've got all her information there. Yeah. And then I'll put a link to your website in the description. Yep. So that way you guys can just go down and click right on it. And do you do all the shipping yourself? Yep, I do it oh. all myself. <laughs> yep. And so you can buy our almonds and then we also have different farm themed merch okay. too. So we have Almond Girl and Almond Farmer stuff, but then we also have fun farm themed farm themed like farmers are essential is mm -hmm. one of our shirts support local farmers and just fun things like that we're yeah. coming up with some new stuff for the for the bloom and the springtime as well fun yep. okay so be and do you ship all over the united states all of, yep just the united just states. the united states yep. right now yep because i'm sure shipping food to other countries has probably got its own yeah, I'm not difficult <laughs> yeah so i mean if it gets really successful though could you see yourself doing some fancy stuff to the almonds yeah you know? i'd love to diversify and maybe like sliced and diced and things like that that yeah. you don't usually see farmer direct things right from. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah okay and yeah that's amazing because it's just a straight from you yep this Fresh, is basically raw, yeah natural. field farm to fork yes exactly you know? farm to fork <laughs> almonds yes. okay thank you yep. Okay, so again, we are in Shafter, California, the Central Valley with Jenny. She is on Instagram at Almond Girl Jenny. There will be a link to her website and her Instagram below. So you guys can go check her out, give her a follow. And thank you so much yes. for having me. And she also helped me a lot, connect me with other farmers in the area for my little road trip down mm -hmm. here. And I really appreciate that. Yes, thank you so much for coming. Yeah, and then uh, maybe one of these days I'll try to get back down here when it's like all in bloom yes. and pretty. Yep. This February, is my winter time. road trip. Yep. I mean, February is still kind of winter too. <laughs> it is. Yeah. All right. Yep. Thanks, guys. Remember to hit that thumbs up button if you enjoyed today's video. Sustainability. It's who we are and what we do. We're in it for the good of farmers. We're increasing the livelihoods and sustainable practices of 500 million smallholder farmers. We're in it for good.